Good morning, good afternoon, and good late evening to our guests from across Canada, the United States, and Asia. Welcome to the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada's virtual presentation and discussion with Ambassador Sujan Chinoy, Director General of India's Manohar Parikar Institute of Defense Studies and Analysis. Today's session is titled, India-China Relations and Contemporary Paradigm. Mesdames et Messieurs, Bienvenue à notre événement en ligne de la Fondation Asie Pacifique du Canada, Relations Indie-Chine, un paradigme contemporain. My name is Christine Nakamura, Vice President of Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada's Toronto office and your host for today's event. To begin, on behalf of the Foundation, I'd like to acknowledge that all places Canadians call home are the traditional territories of many First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. I'd now like to briefly go over a few housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website after the event. Please submit questions you may wish to ask the speaker in the Q&A box on your screen. Time permitting, we'll answer as many questions as possible. Feel free to contact us offline should we run out of time and your questions are not answered. And for technical support during the session, contact events at asiapacific.ca. We have scheduled an hour for today's event. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce a member of the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada's board, Ms. Sandra Pupatello. Ms. Pupatello, a seasoned politician, served from 1995 to 2011 in Ontario's Legislative Assembly. From 2003 until 2011, she held a variety of cabinet posts, too many to list all, but she served the majority of her years in cabinet as minister responsible for economic development, international trade, industry, and investment. Ms. Pupatello took part in many international trade missions during her time as trade minister, accompanying then Premier Delta McGuinty. Destination markets included the Middle East, India, Pakistan, and Japan. After leaving politics in 2011, Ms. Pupatello launched her management consulting firm and worked in the private sector, including for uh, PwC as advisor, industry, global, markets, and public sector. Ms. Pupatello serves on a number of boards, both corporate and nonprofit, and previously chair, uh, served as chair of Hydro One and vice chair of Ontario Global 100. She is the recipient of a number of awards, including the Women's Executive Network, WXN, Top 100 Most Powerful Women in Canada, in 2014 and Bank of Montreal's Innovation and Global Growth Award. Ms. Pufatello is a graduate of the University of Windsor and is married to Jim Bennett, author, lawyer, and former member of Newfoundland and Labrador's House of Assembly. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to invite Sandra to make welcome remarks. Sandra, over to you. Thank you very much. And it is great to see everybody. Welcome, good morning, good evening, and especially a special welcome to our Ambassador Shinoy, Director General of the Manohar Parikar uh, Institute, a leading think tank uh, in India. We're delighted to have you being hosted by the Asia Pacific Foundation. As you know, our role for Canada is to engender greater greater ties with Asia and find out the best ways for our country, our government, our citizens to do that. So a special welcome today, Ambassador, um, to, this, to this discussion. We're particularly interested to see your comments and your advice and your insight in the, the current uh, environment between India and China. And we know right now it's at a particular low level. I think that uh, Canadians can, can sympathize uh, with what is going on there in terms of relationships. We've, we've suffered ourselves uh, in recent years. Um, we think perhaps there may be some warming, in fact, as we know there has been a call between the Prime Minister of India and our own Prime Minister recently in the middle of June. And some of that discussion involved the dispute between the border of India and China, which recently resulted in death, in fact, soldiers' death. Um, we'd like to see some of that uh, insight on your part, Ambassador. We know that uh, the Indian uh, sentiment against China is strong. Uh, in fact, the government has banned WeChat, TikTok, uh, other Chinese uh, apps uh, from use in India. Uh, there's been hotel chains who are refusing uh, uh, guests from China. 
uh, and even their procurement strategy for India is requiring now that you might write your country of origin in the idea that uh, perhaps the Chinese wouldn't be so welcome in India. Uh, there is a long, long standing border and relationship between India and China, and I think the Canadians could learn from that. Uh, in addition, I think the, the, the world, uh, Japan, Australia, US, is perhaps expecting a greater role from Canada um, than what might currently just be seen as an economic interest uh, for us. So we'd be curious to see what your views might be there as well. Uh, and, in, and in fact, anything that you're going to give us, I think we would like to take uh, to our own citizens in Canada, because that's the role of the Asia Pacific Foundation. Uh, so first, to thank you for joining us. Second, we'd love to see your insight. Uh, it's an important world development that is happening between China and India. And uh, I think Canada's long-standing role, um, I think we should be getting back to that on a, on a global stage. So thanks so much. Uh, Christine, back to you. Thank you very much, Sandra, for those opening remarks. Uh, now I'd like to invite our president and CEO, Stu Beck, to introduce today's speaker, Ambassador Chinoy. Stu, over to you. Thank you very much, Christine. And uh, I think everybody who's on the call has a copy of, uh, of uh, Ambassador Chinoy's uh, CV. So I, I will add just a little bit of color. I've, I've known the ambassador uh, for a number of years, we were we served together as uh, consul generals in uh, in Shanghai, and one of the things I used to always uh, was so impressed, uh, I, and I would include uh, the ambassador in whatever conversations I had with politicians from Canada coming and having lunches and dinners at the residence. Uh, I would always invite the the ambassador because he was such a knowledgeable person on China, and uh, you know he has uh, an immense background. He, he's been in Beijing. He's in Shanghai. He speaks. Uh, you know, excellent Mandarin, like he speaks uh, excellent Japanese. Uh, he's really quite a linguist. Uh, and then, of course, we reconnected again when I was high commissioner to India. And at that time, he was working in the National Security Advisor's office, and he was very helpful on a number of critical files for uh, for me, uh, which uh, one of those was our nuclear file, which we managed to put behind us after 45 years of, uh, of problems between Canada and India on nuclear. So uh, again, he's been a great friend um, and a great uh, diplomatic colleague. And it's always nice to know that our wives are good friends and our kids went to the same school. So we've known each other for a long time and have a very good relationship. So a little bit of color behind a fantastic CV. Uh, so Ambassador, over to you for a few words uh, with us this morning. Thank you very much, uh, my good friend, uh, Ambassador Stuart Beck and all the other colleagues uh, that are here this evening for your very kind words and for actually having me over for this webinar. Um, I have been asked to speak for about 15 minutes, so I'll come straight to the point. Uh, in order to analyze India-China relations, and particularly the contemporary paradigm, it's very important to uh, breeze through uh, about 2,000 years of history. Uh, so I'll do that in about two minutes, if I can. Uh, for the most part, let me make this uh, proposition that India and China have lived amicably uh, through about 2,500 years of their history. Our uh, ties begin with the earliest Buddhist links for Buddhism spread from India to East Asia, including to China. Uh, and then in the uh, early part of the Tang dynasty, we had particularly good exchanges we had very important scholars like uh, uh, Fa Xian come to India in the 4th century AD. We had uh, Xuanzhuang come to India in the 7th century AD. And they came for Buddhist scriptures, Pali, Sanskrit, all the ancient uh, script scriptures that we had in India. Uh, in the Middle Ages, by and large, there were fewer contacts. And these were more maritime in nature. We had uh, Cheng He with his uh, voyages out of Nanjing. Uh, who made some sort of, uh, you know, visits to southern India as to Sri Lanka. Uh, and then we fast forward to the 19th century, uh, where we see that uh, uh, British India is uh, actually connecting with China through Hong Kong, through Shanghai, etc. And acquiring territory also in, in Hong Kong and elsewhere. Uh, but for the most part, the peoples of India and China sympathized with one another uh, into the 20th century. But the paths that we took to achieving our nationhood in 1947 for India and 1949 for China couldn't have been more different because Mahatma Gandhi 
uh, on the Indian side was in favor of a complete policy of peace and non-violence in terms of achieving our independence. And things couldn't have been more different on the Chinese side. Because as Mao had said, uh, a revolution is not a dinner party. And, you know, the fact of the matter is that China uh, became the People's Republic of China uh, through a lot of bloodshed and uh, civil war. Uh, so that's the first takeoff uh, point, the point of inflection for looking at contemporary relations between India and China. When we look at the paths that we chose after 1947 for India and 1949 for China, again, things couldn't be more different because India went the Fabian uh, socialism way uh, through the policies that were advocated then by our first prime minister Nehru. And uh, we were a democracy right from the word go as soon as the colonial yoke was lifted. Uh, on the Chinese side, uh, they were a pronounced uh, communist country at loggerheads with just about everybody in a few years, uh, including uh, the Soviet Union and uh, the United States. But India-China relations in the 50s uh, were uh, predicated more on the proposition that uh, two large and populous countries could live peacefully side by side, uh, more particularly because when China entered, uh, you know, uh, Xinjiang in 1949 and Tibet in 1950, uh, the fact uh, of our existence changed. Uh, there were some traditional historical borders that India had uh, with these uh, neighbors like Tibet and Xinjiang. And overnight, uh, those changed because there was a new geographical and geostrategic reality in terms of the People's Republic of China. Nehru, uh, Chon Lai, Mao, that generation often spoke of Asian Brotherhood. Nehru in particular was wedded to that concept. But very soon we had uh, boundary issues that came up because, uh, you know, maps were not clearly defined. And by the time we get to the 1950s, uh, at the end of the 1950s, uh, trouble is brewing on our border. Uh, this results in 1962 in a border conflict, uh, uh, which actually... Uh, creates a, a hiatus for many years between India and China. So from between 1962 to 1976, we were, so to speak, not on talking terms with uh, one another. And China went its own way, nuclearized. India went its own way, uh, you know, trying to consolidate its democracy. Uh, and in 1976, after the creation of uh, Bangladesh in the subcontinent, uh, and after India had had a treaty of peace, uh, and you know, friendship and cooperation with the Soviet Union, we re-established ambassadorial level ties in 1976. After that, uh, uh, in a few years, we were talking to each other in the early 1980s about our boundary question. Uh, and then that led to Rajiv Gandhi's visit as prime minister to China in December 1988. Now that was another point of inflection because it is in that visit that it was agreed that we would shelve aside our boundary question. Uh, and not allow differences uh, on the boundary dispute to hold up progress in the rest of the relationship. So that was the, uh, the paradigm in which we existed until quite recently. Uh, we went through our nuclear tests in 1998, the adverse Chinese reaction. We made up in about two years. Uh, so by the time we get to the year 2000, we are back on track in terms of our relations. And then trade and economic ties progressed. Uh, but uh, as we, uh, you know, moved into the 21st century, uh, we also found that China was becoming less and less responsive uh, to the aspirations of its neighbors, uh, including India. We found that China was stepping into South Asia in a non-transparent manner. It was uh, uh, following policies in uh, uh, the neighborhood of India, including uh, Nepal, Bangladesh and Pakistan. Uh, which were inimical to India's interests. Uh, it had also forayed into the Indian Ocean for the first time in 600 years uh, and uh, was creating a new normal on the maritime front uh, on the pretext of, uh, you know, uh, engaging uh, in anti-piracy operations, uh, etc. And um, we come to a period where our trade and economic relations are also becoming skewed. So... Uh, we end up around 2016-17 with uh, a huge trade imbalance, uh, which uh, in 2019 
had grown to roughly 57 billion dollars. Uh, technology was also bringing in Chinese companies. Companies like Huawei, for instance, had come in through the automatic route in uh, and around 1995, 1996, uh, in the early stages of India's opening up, and had registered in India as an Indian company seeking uh, local national treatment, etc. Um, and in the last few years, uh, China also invested about uh, six billion dollars in the uh, Indian economy, notably in startups and in the technology sphere. So uh, we, we have reached a stage around 2017, by the time we have this face off once again uh, at Doklam uh, on the tri-junction uh, between India, China and Bhutan, we not only have a boundary problem that's been long simmering, but we also reach a stage where the so-called progress in the rest of the relationship has also hit, hit a number of roadblocks. As I said, in trade, it had hit the roadblock of a huge imbalance. In technology, uh, it had hit the roadblock of uh, uh, you know, abiding uh, reservations and apprehensions about uh, data storage, uh, about uh, security, about uh, the opaqueness of Chinese companies in the technology sphere. Uh, we also reach a stage where China is impervious to India's sensitivities with regard to its relationship with Pakistan. There is the added problem of the Belt and Road uh, Initiative, uh, the flagship of which was the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which went through disputed territory. And it was disputed territory as recognized by China and Pakistan themselves in their border agreement of 1963 under Article 6. So they ought not to have created uh, a flagship uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, um, program there uh, called the CPEC without uh, adequate care for these sensitivities. And so all around we find that whether it's the maritime side or whether it's the uh, South Asian geography, uh, China is creating new normals. Uh, China expected the whole world to uh, sort of respect uh, the one China policy, but China was not willing to give the same kind of uh, uh, respect uh, or uh, understanding uh, to India when it came to uh, issues like Jammu and Kashmir, where even the multilateral space in which India and China traditionally cooperated was shrinking because of China's activism at the United Nations in trying to rake up the issue of Jammu and Kashmir, which was considered as an internal issue by India, just as uh, the establishment of the Tibet Autonomous Region in 1965 was considered an internal matter by China. Uh, so there are these issues that uh, were in the background when in uh, you know the last few months we had the latest uh, round of uh, tensions on the border and um, in uh, a remote part of Ladakh in a place uh, called Galwan, uh, 20 of our uh, brave hearts were uh, ambushed uh, by a very large body of uh, Chinese troops. Uh, as you know, there are a number of protocols and agreements in place between the two countries of which I have been uh, a part over the years. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, confidence building measures uh, and uh, uh, sort of CBMs to ensure peace and tranquility uh, in the border areas, uh, which prohibit uh, either side from using, uh, you know, weapons as in no resort to gunshots. That's the policy there. But that did not prevent the Chinese from using barbaric uh, medieval weapons like uh, clubs studded with nails, etc., to ambush. Uh, a small body of our troops that had been monitoring uh, a particular disengagement between the two troops uh, in the Galwan Valley. Um, of course, uh, our people retaliated robustly uh, and uh, uh, we have uh, uh, enough to go by to suggest that uh, they took down many more than 20. Uh, so, uh, but China being, uh, you know, what it is, uh, it's never going to admit uh, the casualties. They have admitted that they had casualties. They have deaths. They've admitted that. But the number, of course, uh, is not going to be like in a democracy where we obviously honor our dead and give them, uh, you know, state funerals as, as, as uh, would be deserving of any soldier that sacrifices his life for his uh, nation. So we are at a stage today on the border where we have uh, long seen China's uh, irredentist kind of uh, behavior. Uh, its uh, flexibility uh, with regard to its own interpretation of the line of actual control, 
the salami slicing kind of approach that it has. But the fact of the matter is that in recent years, uh, the government of Prime Minister Narendra Modi uh, is a robust government. Uh, it is uh, uh, committed to ensuring our sovereignty and territorial integrity. Uh, and therefore, there are many red lines uh, that the Chinese uh, cannot cross. Uh, and um, uh, when they do, they obviously uh, do not uh, uh, run into uh, you know, butter. They run into steel out there. Uh, I think it was Stalin who had said that when you probe, you probe with uh, a bayonet. And uh, if you uh, come across uh, steel, you stop. If you come across mush, you push uh, further. Uh, in this case, uh, the Chinese are obviously running into steel uh, today when they meet up with us on the border. Now, my point here is that uh, uh, there are a number of reasons why China did what it did on the uh, border. Uh, there could be internal reasons. The 2010 GDP was supposed to be doubled by 2020. Uh, that's not happened. Uh, China is moving after the 19th Party Congress in 2017. It's going to have the 20th Party Congress uh, quite soon in 2022. Before that, in 2021, China is going to have, uh, you know, uh, uh, the 100th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic, uh, the Communist Party of China. Um, and uh, uh, Xi Jinping, of course, is a very strong uh, centralized authoritarian leader with no successor. Uh, so the economic uh, problems that China has faced in recent years, uh, plus the looming uh, sort of anniversaries that are coming up may have prompted uh, a much greater degree of nationalism and hubris. Uh, externally, um, there is uh, growing criticism of China's uh, behavior. Um, China's uh, uh, sort of uh, covering up of facts during the early stages of the COVID crisis. Uh, internally in China too, there are questions being asked. Uh, there are scholars, there are dis dissidents who raise their voice uh, and uh, are promptly arrested. Uh, externally, uh, China obviously has a siege mentality today with the kind of uh, uh, you know, developments uh, we have seen in Xinjiang, um, in Tibet, in Hong Kong, and in Taiwan, in the South China Sea. Uh, the United States, of course, has pronounced itself um, in, a, in a legal manner by having the Taipei Act, for instance, on the Hong Kong you know, uh, Democracy Act, uh, or the you know uh, Uyghur uh, Act, etc. So all this is possibly adding to a sense of uh, uh, vulnerability uh, and a siege mentality as well. Uh, so there are there are those reasons as well, apart from the strictly bilateral reasons to do with uh, uh, an acquisitive mode that China has with regard to territory, which has been seen uh, in the East China Sea vis-à-vis -vis Japan and the Senkakus. Uh, uh, where, where trouble has been brewing recently. Uh, we have seen that in the South China Sea. We have seen that in the various incidents of late uh, uh, that the Chinese have had vis-a-vis -vis Japan, vis-a-vis -vis Vietnam, uh, Malaysia, uh, even Indonesia, which is not a party to the South China Sea dispute, has not been spared because of Chinese unilateral uh, action in the Natuna Islands, uh, which, of course, uh, Indonesia is loath to countenance and accept. Uh, so there is a, a growing clamor uh, to call out China. Uh, there is um, obviously uh, a reaction to China's uh, actions also. In India, to put it very briefly, uh, the immediate uh, uh, sort of uh, point here is that the sentiment at the level of the people of India is extremely, extremely uh, against China. There is, a, there is a very strong sentiment today in India uh, about what has happened on the border. It's seen as uh, an act of perfidy uh, and uh, you know, uh, an act that is totally unacceptable to the people of India. Um, the people of India are behind the government of India uh, in ensuring our sovereignty and territorial integrity. The fallout is the uh, immediate banning of uh, uh, 59 Chinese apps that includes uh, this formidable app called TikTok and stuff like that. It's all gone out. Uh, it's been trashed completely. It's been banned using our Information Security Act of uh, 2000 and the other uh, amendments to it of 2009. Uh, we have, uh, uh, that is to say, the government of India has banned 59 apps. Uh, I think there will be a fallout on trade as well. That's the demand. 
uh, but trade will be a harder nut to crack as it will be for the united states uh, as it has already been for japan uh, which has uh, its own kind of uh, interdependence with china uh, so whether it's australia whether it's japan whether it's uh, the united states or india trade and decoupling on the trade front is going to be a little harder for everybody i consider that to be the foundation and the substructure there is the superstructure of technology which is also being weaponized today and it is the cleavage along which the world is being divided into two groups today on on the on the on the subject of technology that is where the reactions globally today are uh, coming in more rapidly uh, you just uh, seen how the uk has uh, decided to ban huawei from its 5g networks and to get them out of the telecom networks by 2027 uh in the case of india uh i uh, would simply like to say that this matter is still under consideration uh, but uh, more likely than not uh, i would suspect that will be very difficult under the current circumstances for india to allow any kind of 5g access uh, to china uh, it has a lot to do also with our fundamental positions uh, on the osaka track for instance at the g20 last year uh, where even uh you know a proposal made by a friend a very close strategic partner like japan on uh, uh you know the transfer of data uh with enhanced security across borders uh is not uh, something that has found favor uh with uh, the indian establishment so there is a reaction against china uh, globally and in india in india it is uh, uh, particularly related to the recent incidents i mean these are my opening remarks Uh, i think i've exhausted my 15 minutes so i should stop here to permit you to engage uh, in a broader conversation thank you very much thank you very much ambassador chinoy now it gives me great pleasure to hand over the mic to my colleagues uh, stu beck and uh, and dr jeff reeves our vp of research so over to you to uh, moderate the session discussion thank you very much Uh, thank you very much Christine and thank you uh, ambassador for a, a great presentation and great overview and Jeff and I will now do some probing uh, of your of your comments and uh, we'll look forward to whatever questions people want to pose and uh, we'll we'll get to those as we go through the the next half hour uh but ambassador uh you've been in China for an awful long time uh you know and understand it i know you were there with uh, when ambassador menon who you know again was a great uh, indian diplomat was part of this process um uh, you know in your you know recommendations i'm sure the government will be talking to you often about how to manage the china relationship but we all have to live with china and from your own perspective how do you see us you know how do you see you and india going forward uh, understanding that it's a reality that the world has to cope with the second largest economy uh, and one that's becoming more robust in its pro uh, outward projection uh, is this is this, you know you talked about decoupling is this a realistic approach Uh, at the end of the day in the context of what's happening globally right now. So I'd start with that that it's just probing a little bit more some of the things that you said because I think it's important for us uh, from a Canadian perspective to understand how a neighbor that's so close to China is coping with the reality that is just facing all of us right now. Look, to be very frank, uh, India obviously wants good relations with all its neighbors including the People's Republic of China and uh, it is not for want of trying. that we are at this stage today india has made every effort as i said to uh, you know be responsive to china's sensitivities uh, to be responsive to the rise of china as well uh, but this has not been reciprocated uh, as i have said before at some other places uh, you see uh, china has risen dramatically in the last 35 years but it's not as if the rest of the world has been standing still Uh, we have all made progress canada has made progress india has made progress countries of southeast asia have made progress and so therefore it's equally important that china recognize the relative rise of others and as it expects the world to adjust to the rise of china and accommodate the rise of china so also china must accommodate the relative rise and aspirations of others if this does not happen you are setting up the situation for a contradiction now my proposition is that change to china has come about so rapidly in a short span of about 35 years that is the same generation that was in blue and green tunics on bicycles that is today riding uh, you know eight cylinder cars uh, mercedes benz and luxury cars etc 
and so therefore it's been very difficult for china to truly understand the nature of change that has overtaken china to understand the concept of power to understand how power can be exercised in uh, a geo strategic or geo economic manner without inviting pushback i think this is where china has failed abysmally it has failed to reassure its neighbors it has failed to reassure its strategic partners as well of its intentions uh, and its motivations in the long run so this kind of a situation creates more difficulties uh, i believe that uh, uh, as far as uh, uh, trade is concerned in india's case the focus today is on make in india and there is also the atmanirbhar bharat program which is to say make india self reliant a lot of this has to do with the uh, you know challenges that have been unleashed by covid 19 it has been uh, the greatest uh, source of disruption for global supply chains uh, quite apart from the fact that technology even before covid 19 and global supply chains even before covid 19 had been weaponized had been politicized and there was already a trend uh, globally for uh, countries like the united states and others to question this over reliance overweening dependence that everybody had on china it gave this dependence gave china a unilateral advantage as it has uh, with regard to say for instance canada uh, and we on our part at this stage uh, would like to believe that uh, uh, covid Uh, has given us an opportunity to reset uh, these deficiencies in our outlook uh, the chinese challenge on our borders has also further made us determined and resolute in our outlook that we have to be self reliant in many ways we have to cooperate uh, but on equal terms we have to cooperate keeping in mind our security and uh, we would like to do that but at the same time we would like to ensure that technology Uh, including in the telecom and power and other sectors uh, where hitherto for we have been uh, kind of reliant on on china that uh, we need to do more ourselves and we are ready to bear that pain as well uh, but we will definitely go down that road may i just inform you that as far as the domestic market in china is concerned uh, you know 5g let's say 5g in china um, china itself has granted 5g licenses within china 50% to Huawei, 34% to ZTE, and just a token amount to Ericsson Nokia. Uh, so for China, its own market is always closed, whether it's for trade or for technology. Uh, it may use uh, Google and uh, Twitter overseas, but domestically in China, these very same, uh, you know, global platforms are banned. Um, and so it seeks 5G access in the rest of the world, but it's not ready to give the same kind of access. to foreign companies within china so we have seen this dichotomous situation coming from uh, an economy which is still not considered a market economy at the end of 15 years of uh, membership of the wto the broad expectation was that china in uh, 2016 on completion of 15 years would be recognized as a market economy as of today uh, not many countries uh in the developed world have actually given china market status uh, market economy status so we need to keep that in mind uh as far as our trade is concerned i thought i should mention this point to you also it might be of interest that um, in the uh, you know uh, at, uh, in the in the area of trade india constitutes a mere 3% of china's exports to the world um and yet we contribute roughly 19% of china's trade surplus so you can imagine uh, uh, what a big trade surplus uh, china has with india 19% of all china's trade surplus is with india of course you know the the monstrous uh, trade surplus they have with the united states of america uh, and therefore you know the chinese trade surplus with india has grown 291 times uh, Uh, from the year 2000 to 2018 as compared to uh, uh, just uh, 16 times uh, with other countries we have been facing this disadvantage in trade and economic relations as well we are determined to set that right so we are next door to each other we will uh, try to cooperate wherever possible but uh, it's certainly not going to be business as usual uh, that's out of the question 
that uh, broad consensus which was developed in 1988 that you set aside the border no matter what happens you don't allow the rest of the relationship to be impacted that i think is behind us and we will be looking at a number of options uh, as we go from here ambassador thank you so much for your your wonderful comments uh, very informative and i i've learned a lot I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the role of China within India's foreign policy outlook in particular with respect to the Modi government's uh, Indo-Pacific vision and whether or not some of the challenges happening between India and China right now will lead uh New Delhi to to seek better cooperation with the other free and open Indo-Pacific proponent states like Japan, uh the United States and Australia. Yes, I think uh we should bear in mind that india was one of the few countries right from the word go that spoke of uh, the free and open indo pacific in the context of it being an inclusive architecture right from the word go so uh, there are various uh, claimants to this uh, concept uh, most people actually uh, are aware that it came out of uh, uh, a think tank in india uh, about which i don't want to boast any more uh the necessary uh, but some of these writings were were uh, available in india very early on um and uh, some of our maritime experts had been talking about the indo pacific as a concept as i personally see it the indo pacific is a representative concept today it's representative of contemporary reality which uh, goes beyond the uh, initial success in uh, economic growth that was enjoyed by east asia and subsequently by southeast asia today growth has spread to the rest of asia all the way to the shores of africa therefore the indo pacific is a contemporary concept it is more democratic and open and inclusive the chinese pref prefer the concept to remain asia pacific uh, because that emphasizes chinese centrality the indo pacific in their view dilutes chinese centrality and shifts the focus to other parts of asia that is something that uh, uh, they uh, intensely Uh, dislike and suspect now my prime minister spoke quite candidly and openly uh, at the shangri la uh, summit in uh, at the shangri la dialogue in 2018 that in india's view uh, it is uh, a concept that should be inclusive uh, and it is not directed at any country uh, that being said uh, over the last few years because precisely Uh, the notion of the indo-pacific and more particularly the notion of the quad uh, is uh, a function of the geostrategic environment which itself is being shaped by china's behavior uh, in the last few years the focus has moved towards greater convergence between some of the key players in the indo-pacific what we commonly call the quad the quad is not the same as the indo-pacific but yes it is a very important element and uh, a, a part of the indo pacific where a number of these concepts are routinely discussed it has gradually taken on uh, a, a more broad based discussion uh, not just limited to infrastructure and capacity building uh, and hadr but also to uh, some security issues uh, and uh, therefore i think that um, much will depend on china's behavior much will depend on the threat perceptions that others have in terms of how the quad evolves the quad today as you know is already talking to other partners in the quad plus format it used the covid-19 to engage uh, countries obviously like uh, south korea vietnam new zealand and on the other flank even as far away as israel and brazil uh, were engaged by uh, the quad in the quad plus format as far as the indo pacific is concerned the, the growing convergence between some of the key and principal uh, players like the united states japan australia and india is that everybody now agrees that it should be open free open democratic uh, sorry the word democratic i must emphasize has been slowly dropped in the last uh, uh, year or year and a half as people realize that a number of other key players that you like included and associated are not necessarily democracies so the word democracy has slowly slipped out but free uh, and open and uh, inclusive architecture freedom of navigation and overflight these are some of the the convergences that have uh, emerged uh, and uh, 
uh, i have no doubt that uh, uh, the uh, the the quad is going to obviously uh, look at uh, the changing geo strategic and geo economic environment uh, in terms of shaping its own future as far as the indo pacific is concerned uh, broadly uh, there is agreement among all the key players that asean centrality uh, is uh, one of the key planks of the indo pacific uh, and um, in doing so uh, one has to also keep in mind that the asean uh, as a group uh, has uh, recently spoken out uh, against unilateralism um, but that is uh, also not to be taken too seriously because when it comes to uh, bilateral engagement with china each of the asean countries uh, has its own limitations uh, there are some like uh, laos cambodia myanmar who can do very little in order to make their point of view uh, known to the chinese and the chinese have mastered the art of fracturing the consensus in asia at the end of the day let's not forget that the code of conduct does not involve say uh, india or australia or japan uh, in terms of shaping the outcome of the code of conduct it's still strictly between the asean and china and so to that extent of course the chinese will look at asean centrality as a, some kind of an opportunity as well an opportunity to shape the core uh, of the indo pacific since everybody else is agreed that asean is central and asean is engaged with china in that core issue of the code of conduct china has a greater chance of shaping its outcome and determining the future course of the indo pacific to that extent i think they have adopted a a kind of uh, uh, wait and see mode Uh, as uh, uh, contrasted to its earlier reaction uh, that the indo pacific is to be rejected at all costs uh, it's uh, what was it described uh, as by wangi uh, wangi had said that it is like the uh, froth on the ocean waves that will dissipate very soon obviously it's not froth it's not dissipating if anything uh, the waters that lap uh, india are also the same waters that lap uh, you know the Uh, coasts of japan and and australia and hawaii and uh, uh, you know uh, uh, california and uh, people are going to come closer together uh so so john we have a, a few questions that have come up and uh, i'm hope we can get to all of them but uh we'll kind of paraphrase just for simplicity and uh, that froth is also being felt in uh, in vancouver so we're uh, being on the west coast uh, it's something that we uh, we know and understand uh, and i'm just going to take one question that has a, a certain implication for canada as well um with the anti the rise of anti china sentiment in india um we see a lot of uh, a lot of this reflecting in how people are treating chinese people in the country here in canada uh, how are you defending against sort of uh, the indo chinese in particular uh, uh in west bengal and other places is this something that you're you're beginning to see and and how are you dealing with that as a as an issue uh look uh, india is uh, itself a, a pluralistic society and there's no gain saying the fact that uh, uh, everyone must be equal in the eyes of the law and every uh, foreigner in india must also be uh, protected by law so i am personally against uh, the idea of uh, uh, ill treating or mistreating anyone um now we are as i said a, a very large country uh, with uh, uh, different kinds of uh, you know uh, sort of uh, peoples in india it's, uh, as well we have a large number of people uh, you know that uh, may look like the chinese but they are indian and so indians are quite used to uh, you know not regarding uh, anyone who looks uh, kind of asian as being chinese because we have a very large mix in india itself you know and you've been in india so you are so familiar with uh, the variety that we have uh, so i i don't think uh, uh, that is an issue um uh, the chinese people we have nothing against the chinese people and no one should have anything against the chinese people uh, it, they, these are government policies that we are speaking of these are uh, you know sort of uh, uh, ill thought out policies that the chinese government has that we are speaking of people everywhere are to be respected and i i i doubt very much if uh, uh, there would be uh, you know disagreement with what i'm saying in india uh, at least i have no hesitation in saying that uh, 
you cannot pick on individual people and uh, make them a scapegoat uh, for what their governments are doing. And I wouldn't want that to be done to me or my family if they were in another part of the world. So we will keep that completely uh, under control. That should be the way we should look at it. Jeffrey, you want to take one of those questions on the list there? Sure. Uh, before I do, though, I, I wonder if I could just get the ambassador to make a quick comment on the Hong Kong and the uh, perceptions within India at the state level, within the broader kind of academic policymaker community, and then within society is Hong Kong uh, a big issue? And it's something uh, that uh, um, we have clear kind of indicators within the, uh, the Indian domestic kind of context about how people are thinking about this? Well, look, uh, uh, we have uh, bigger fish to fry. I begin with that proposition that currently in India-China relations, we have many more things to deal with. Uh, but that does not mean that Hong Kong is not important to India. Uh, if we con put it into context, into historical context, you are aware that it was one of the key planks in uh, the connective uh, uh, you know, tissue between India and China. Uh, uh, my own ancestors traded with China. They would have gone... Uh, you know, by the maritime route 200 years ago. Uh, and uh, so Hong Kong's played a very important role uh, in India-China relations. Uh, even after the People's Republic of China came into being, a very large number of Indians who had settled in China, the Sikhs, for instance, who had started the dairy industry in China in the 1920s and 30s, and who had settled around Shanghai and Guangzhou, many of them went and settled in Hong Kong. Some of them came back to India. So Hong Kong's always been important. Uh, going back to 1842, Hong Kong's always been important. Today, it is home to a very large Indian community. Uh, and a lot of India's uh, trade uh, also gets done through Hong Kong. Uh, a fair bit of trade uh, with that region is done through Hong Kong. So we have actually uh, spoken out about it also. At the 44th session of the uh, Human Rights Council, uh, which was held between 30 June and uh, which is being held between 30 June and 21st July in Geneva, the uh, Indian representative has already said that given the large Indian community that makes Hong Kong special administrative region of China its home, India has been keeping a close watch on recent developments. We have heard several statements expressing concern on these developments and we hope that the relevant parties will take into account these views and address them properly, seriously, and objectively. That's the kind of statement we have made. Uh, I, of course, uh, have been witness to having lived in Hong Kong myself in the early 80s before the 84 Accord. The Sino-British Accord of 1984 um, took place uh, you know, uh, while I was uh, in Hong Kong uh, until 1984. And uh, through the 80s, when I was in Beijing, I've seen uh, the negotiations between Great Britain and China that ultimately led to the uh, handover in 1997 uh, and the commitments then made by China under the basic law of Hong Kong were to allow for the next 50 years uh, the uh, systems that had made Hong Kong what it uh, was. I can't say it, it, it still is because it has already greatly changed uh, in the last uh, uh, 23 odd years. But the National Security uh, Act that the Chinese have recently passed, obviously, uh, once and for all, puts paid to the uh, one country, two systems formula. Now, that was, if you recall, supposed to also be an example of sorts at the academic level, at least, to Taiwan, as to prove to Taiwan that, look, uh, two systems can coexist. So I think it will deal a blow and has dealt a blow mentally to the people in Taiwan as well, that if this can happen to Hong Kong, then obviously there's no, not much scope for any kind of two systems or slightly different systems coexisting in one country. At the uh, other end, it was also somehow an example to the Tibetans uh, outside of China uh, that the one country, two systems uh, uh, you know, formula could be applicable there also in terms of a broader reconciliation. Now, don't forget that the 17-point uh, agreement that had been reached between uh, the administration of the Dalai Lama uh, in 1951, shortly after the Chinese entered Tibet, between Peking and Lhasa, the 17-point agreement 
also had language which was very similar to the basic uh, law of uh, Hong Kong, which is preservation of the existing systems, preservation of culture. But by the time you got to the late 1950s, uh, in fact, by the time you get to 1956, uh, when the Kampa uh, you know, rebellion started in the eastern part of Tibet, uh, that 17 point agreement was also thrown out of the window. So China has a history of reaching such agreements whereby it guarantees a certain system uh, as it did for Tibet in 1950s and as it did for Hong Kong uh, in 1997 and then uh, you know unilaterally uh, casting it aside. Uh, so I think uh, uh, that's uh, something that we need to note. Uh, the academic community in India of course uh, feels strongly today on a number of issues. Uh, they, they would broadly agree with what I uh, am stating but there may be exceptions. Um, uh, Sujan, just a, a, again, a question around the, the, uh, the clash in Galwin. Um, how do you, again, with your background in, in China, how do you see the role of the PLA itself versus what's going on in Beijing at the political level? Is there, is there tensions that are existing there that a lot of people don't really understand? I think you're much closer to it from, a, from an Indian perspective than we would be in Canada. So that would be something that I think would, would be interesting to the audience just to get a sense from... Uh, you know, that tension that exists, or is there a tension that exists between the PLA and the, and the, you know, the party leadership? I personally don't think so, because we have to keep in mind that the PLA is a creature of the party. Uh, it has always been a creature of the party. Uh, it is the party that created the PLA, not the other way around. And being a creature of the party, the PLA then gifted to uh, the mother load, which is the, uh, you know, mother node, which is the, the party, the People's Republic of China in 1949. So the PLA has always been subservient to the party. Uh, and the party has always ensured that uh, that has uh, been the case uh, in the history of China. So personally, I don't uh, subscribe to the theory that there are tensions between the PLA and the party. Uh, there can be <clears throat> some tensions uh, between uh, individual leaders <clears throat> within or without outside of the PLA. But the party is in control. Uh, and therefore, PLA's actions uh, on whether on India's borders or whether elsewhere are of a piece with the party line. Now, the PLA is not acting on its own. It is following the party's dictates, the party's guidelines. And it will remain that. Ambassador, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't raise the issue of how Canada and India could cooperate more, uh, particularly with respect to some of the challenges that, that both countries are facing with China, uh, and perhaps whether or not their partnership could actually lead to a strengthening of institutions uh, in line with the Indo-Pacific or in the Asia-Pacific, and how that kind of cooperation might play out in a multilateral setting with the United States, for example. Well, uh... I think India and Canada can do well to uh, cooperate with one another. Um, we have uh, very good relations to start with historically. There have been two phone conversations recently between our uh, two prime ministers uh, on the 16th uh, of June and earlier on the 29th of April. Uh, both these conversations actually focused on uh, the need to cooperate in the COVID-19 induced uh, environment and to collaborate in terms of, uh, uh, you know, meeting the challenge of the health and economic crisis that has unfolded globally. The contraction of uh, the economies everywhere, the health crisis, which has shown up, uh, you know, the uh, sort of uh, uh, shortages, shortcomings of uh, the healthcare sector everywhere, which has been overwhelmed. Even in the best of countries, it has been overwhelmed. Uh, so they've agreed to be a force, the India-Canada partnership can be a force for the good uh, of the people of the world in a post-COVID uh, environment. Uh, they need to strengthen multilateral institutions together. Um, and Prime Minister Modi has, of course, thanked uh, the Canadian uh, Prime Minister for the help that it has rendered Indian citizens in Canada. We have a natural convergence on global issues as well. Uh, so uh, that background is there, but I personally feel that there are some difficulties uh, in our relations which should not be ignored because they will set uh, some kind of uh, 
uh, you know, uh, limits on what we can actually do together. And now, personally, I feel that uh, the uh, issue of uh, uh, Khalistan, for instance, uh, and its supporters in Canada keeps coming to the mind and to the fore when people look at and analyze uh, India-Canada relations. And now uh, there is also the Pakistan factor. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, now we, many of us here believe that, uh, uh, you know, Delhi-Ottawa relations uh, take a hit from time to time, uh, not just because of the activities of the uh, Khalistanis uh, in Canada, uh, supporters the, of, of the so-called Khalistan, but also the increasing influence uh, of Pakistan on this subject. Uh, for instance, uh, Canadians of uh, a so-called uh, pro-Khalistani background uh, and Pakistani descent are working together in Canada and they assume significant positions in the Liberal Party of Canada, uh, especially in the Trudeau government. Um, the Defence Minister of Canada, Harjit Singh uh, Sajjan, the Science and Technology Minister, uh, all of them have publicly spoken uh, out uh, for this so-called Khalistan. They've been roundly criticized by people like Captain Amrinder Singh, the Chief Minister of uh, Punjab. Um, so there is a certain sensitivity in India to this issue, which I'm afraid is lost in Canada. Uh, most Canadians are indifferent to this particular sensitivity in India. And I thought it's my duty to let you know. Um, there is um, a, a government caucus in Canada, which has... Uh, four Pakistani Canadians also. Uh, the Pakistanis number very few in Vancouver, and yet they have uh, a consulate general in Vancouver that actually takes more interest in what the Indian community there is doing or what the Khalistanis are doing uh, than uh, servicing their own nationals. So there are these issues, I think, which come in the, in the way. But I think we have to look at the fact that India and Canada uh, traditionally and historically have very good relations. We are democracies. We have a very large uh, number of uh, Indians, including Indian students uh, in Canada. Uh, we have uh, what uh, Ambassador Stuart Beck referred to, uh, you know, an agreement that we have reached on uh, fairly complex issues such as uh, civil nuclear cooperation. Uh, we are buying about 7 million pounds of uranium yellow cake from from Canada um, and uh, uh, Canada is part of virtually every uh, important uh, uh, developmental project in India, uh, you know, capacity building project. Um, so tourism has been growing um, and uh, we, therefore, I personally am very optimistic about the future of our ties. But uh, I think Canadian think tanks like yours uh, and scholars uh, and opinion makers need to uh, of course, uh, take some guidance from uh, Ambassador Stuart Beck, who has been High Commissioner in India and has vast experience uh, and a personal feel for these things. Uh, but you have to take this a little seriously uh, because uh, it's, it's very difficult for the people of India to accept that the Canadian political system will simply permit this to, uh, you know, question India's sovereignty and territorial integrity. And if you expect uh, no backlash, then that's being impacted. Well, uh, Ambassador, uh, this has been a fantastic uh, conversation. Uh, I, I take on board what you're, what you're saying in your last comments. Uh, it's complicated in India. It's, uh, it's a diverse uh, country with many different types of uh, regions and personalities and people. Uh, the same is true of Canada. As you know, we, we are uh, a large multicultural country with uh, different uh, immigration patterns with different, uh, different wants and uh, interests. Uh, and at the political level, we are a democracy and people will be able to express what they want. So I, certainly what you're saying is, uh, is we can't uh, ignore that, that um, but we have to understand how we, what we deal with the, real, the reality of the politics, just like you do in, um, in India, it's, uh, it's complicated. Um, there are some many questions that uh, I still have, uh, you know, the role of uh, the United States in, this con in the context of what's going on between yourself and China right now. It's, uh, uh, we haven't talked much about the United States. Their position in the world has changed uh, dramatically in the last uh, last three to four years. It impacts us. I'm sure it impacts you, and how we uh, how we we proceed going forward. I think maybe there's some lessons learned that we can have at some time uh, uh, over a, 
a beer somewhere at some point to say, how are, how are you dealing with this, uh, with the issues of the, the greater global reality? But um, fundamentally, it's just been a, a great conversation with you. It's been an hour well spent for most people. Uh, I see, Sandra, you're still on the line. Are there any final words that you'd like to make, like, like to make on behalf of the board uh, um, to Ambassador Chinoy before we, uh, before we end the session? Uh, yes. Oh, let me just start this up again. I think we got uh, closed out. There we go. Hopefully. Thanks so much. I thoroughly enjoyed that. And I, I really take to heart to some of the comments uh, that our ambassador has made. And I think, Stuart, that will lead uh, uh, you and I and the board uh, and the organization uh, perhaps down a road of conversation internally and then externally that might be useful to Canada. Uh, so I really appreciate hearing your thoughts, Ambassador. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Chinoy. Thank you, Jeff, for, uh, for joining in the questions and uh, for all those who participated today. Uh, it's been a, a great a great hour for us to, uh, to learn what's going on in a part of the world that's very important to Canada going forward. So thank you, Ambassador, and I hope we uh, touch base again uh, very shortly. Indeed. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you all very much. Thank you.